Hello, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. Today, we're continuing our video series on the authority of Scripture, focusing on what exactly it means for the Bible to be inerrant and the use and importance of proper hermeneutics. Oh, boy. According to my systematic theology book, the inerrancy of scripture means that scripture in the original manuscript does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact, which is a pretty good definition and makes sense if we are suggesting that the Bible is the product of a God that is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good. He would never lie to us then. He has the power to convey his words exactly as he intended for his purposes, and he is never mistaken. As such, the Bible will never say anything that is false false or contrary to fact, which brings us to point counterpoint. Actually, the Bible gets things wrong all the time. Okay, like what? Like everything. Like it says the world is only 12,000 years old and actually it's like billions. Well, uh, some people do believe the earth is young, but the Bible does not make that claim. And we need to separate what the Bible says from interpretation. The Bible says sunrise and sunset. Actually, uh, the sun isn't moving, the earth is rotating. It says the four corners of the earth. Actually, the earth is a sphere. There are no corners. It's called science. Ever heard of it? Yeah, I've heard of science. But writing from a perspective or writing in layman's terms is not the same as saying something false. We're all aware of the heliocentric view of our universe, but we still say the sun rose or set. Our weatherman says it that way. It's listed on our weather apps that way. We're talking about from a perspective and sometimes we're using layman's terms. A statement may not be technical or literal, but that doesn't make it false or contrary to fact in its meaning. Four corners doesn't mean there are literally four corners any more than calling God the rock. It's suggesting that God is a composite of two or more minerals. Dude, the Gospels have contradictory accounts. They have different accounts, but they're not contradictory. They can be harmonized if one is inclined, but actually the differences in details makes them more reliable. If they said exactly the same thing, scholars would dismiss them as nothing but collusion. Lies are uniform. The fact that they have divergent details lends to their credibility and suggests that they are the product of eyewitness testimony. We see this in contemporary situations. Different newspapers reporting on the same event will all get the same basic points the same, but they'll each contain different details, and that's exactly what we have with the Gospels. Same basic points, different highlighted details. You know, even the Bible says there is no God. In context, it says the fool says in his heart there is no God, which leads me to my next point, that inerrancy of scripture doesn't mean that it's free from contradictions or errors in interpretation. We still have to practice proper hermeneutics. The Bible is comprised of different genres and literary styles. It's got historical narratives, poetry, songs, genealogies, letters. Some of it is metaphorical or figurative, and other parts are literal and factual. So even though it's inerrant in its context, it needs to be rightly interpreted in its context or we're going to error. So when the Bible says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, that doesn't mean that God has really long arms or that his name is Shirley. Or when it says, the moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed, that doesn't mean that Christians believe that the moon and sun have feelings. What is figurative in context must be interpreted as figurative, and what's literal in context must be interpreted as literal in order to understand the inerrant meaning behind it. Now that's not always the easiest thing to sort out, and some of the biggest disagreements in Christendom stem from that question. Is the communion the literal body and blood of Christ, or is it figurative? Is the seven-day creation account literal 24-hour days, or is it more symbolic? The Bible may be without error, but our interpretation can certainly err. And just as there's figurative and literal speech in the Bible, there's descriptive and prescriptive texts. Descriptive text describes what happened, 
prescriptive texts prescribe or command things to us and confusing the two leads to error. So for instance, in Numbers, when Phineas runs a spear through a man named Zimri and a Midianite woman and God commends them for it, we shouldn't take that as prescriptive and start killing sinners with spears. That is descriptive. Whereas when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, that is prescriptive, a very important distinction. Point, counterpoint. counterpoint. Actually, in that Numbers passage, that was prescriptive. God commands that they kill those yoke themselves to the Baal of Peor. We just ignore that because we don't like it. Same thing with eating shellfish and pork and wearing clothes woven of more than one kind of material. Okay, that's actually a fair point. We have to make a further distinction. A text might be prescriptive in a way, but not universal in application. So for instance, God says, lie on your left side and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. God is not commanding us to sleep a certain way or something because you're not the you in that sentence. God is talking to Ezekiel in the context. He's prescribing things to Ezekiel, not to everyone. God commands specific things for specific individuals or specific people in specific places, in specific circumstances, at specific times in human history. And what is prescribed specifically should not be applied universally. Uh, so you can have a shrimp cocktail even though God told you not to? Well, for starters, I think shrimp cocktails are gross, so I would never, but more importantly, God didn't tell me not to. He told the Israelites under the Mosaic law not to eat shrimp. I'm not an Israelite, and I'm not under the Mosaic covenant. I'm a Gentile, and I'm under the new covenant, which is ushered in by Jesus. This isn't really that difficult to understand if you look at it in its context, if you read the Bible in its entirety. But for those who don't, those who are biblically illiterate, it's confusing and will come off as arbitrary and so you'll hear statements like this. The Bible says homosexuality is a sin, but it also says eating pork is a sin too, so... See, that's not particularly convincing to someone who's read things like Acts chapter 10 in which it explicitly declares all foods to be clean, but they're also conflating a cultural convention, which is not universally applicable, with a moral law, which is universally applicable. God, when he is prescribing these dietary rules, is not only operating as God, but also as king of the nation of Israel. So he gives them moral laws and cultural conventions, which every society has rules that pertain to both. Do not murder is a rule that is reflective of the moral law. It's universally true and applicable. But things like the rules of traffic or the tax code are cultural conventions. It varies, it changes, it's relative to the culture and is not universally applicable. Uh, okay, so it's fine to cheat on your taxes just because it's a cultural convention? No, of course not. There is a moral component to obeying the laws of the land, even if those laws are cultural conventions. It's wrong to cheat on your taxes, just as it was wrong for the Israelites to disobey the dietary rules. But tax laws vary from place to place. They change all the time. What's wrong one moment might be fine the next, but that is not the case when it comes to the moral law. So in our interpretation of prescriptive texts, we have to correctly identify who God is directing. Is it limited to a person or people or a time, or is it for all people at all times? Is it a moral law or a cultural convention? Now, deciphering between the two might require some diligence, but a good rule of thumb to identify a moral law is this. Is it stated in the Old Testament and restated in the New? Sidebar. This isn't always the easiest thing to grasp. For instance, when the Apostle Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Is that a universal claim about the authority of women in the church for all time? Or is it a limited command directed for a particular time or to a particular culture or region or church? Some Christians will point to this passage and others like it and argue that in context, it is a prescriptive text that applies to all women at all times and therefore they put restrictions on women in leadership. Other Christians will argue that it can't be a universal directive because in other parts of scripture we see female judges, female leaders, female prophets, and even indications of female deacons. This is a valid debate between Christians of good faith who all believe that the Bible is the word of God and that it's authoritative. And the reality is there are passages that are ambiguous or nuanced and that require interpretation. The same person that wrote, I don't permit a woman to teach a man, also wrote, in Christ there's neither male nor female. 
That's not contradictory, but it does demand interpretation in order to understand what each statement means in its context. That's a valid debate. What is not valid is obfuscating what God has made clear and calling it interpretation. There are plenty of things in the Bible that are not ambiguous or nuanced, where God is perfectly clear on his position and presents a single, unified perspective and states it over and over again throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And muddying those passages because we don't happen to like them is not interpreting scripture, it's ignoring scripture, and that's not valid. Well, that'll do for today. Next week, we'll be talking about the manuscript evidence and how the scriptures are reconstructed. Once again, at the end of August, ATC will separate from the social media accounts of TCC. So if you watch on YouTube, subscribe to the Appropriate in the Culture YouTube channel now. If you view this on Facebook, join my author's Facebook page. If your preferred social media platform is Instagram, you can follow me at Appropriate in the Culture, all one word. They follow will earn you a follow back. And if you listen in podcast form, subscribe to Appropriate in the Culture on Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, Pandora, etc. And I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Mm -hmm.